Things on 2, live from the stick, tomorrow at 7 on Fox 2. The end is near for Giants baseball at Candlestick Park. Tonight's game is the final night game. Most candidates for mayor of San Francisco jumped at the chance to speak at tonight's televised debate, but two said no thank you. We'll have a live report. Activists today called attention to a new report that says crossing the street in some Bay Area cities can be risky business. In San Francisco police take aim at potential Y2K problems, but not the kind of problems that come from a computer. Those stories, all the news on this Wednesday night, September 29th, 1999. And now, the award-winning 10 o'clock news on Channel 2, the number one primetime newscast in the country. Good evening, I'm Dennis Richmond. And I'm Leslie Griffith. How many San Francisco Giants fans have left a night game at Candlestick saying never again? Well, tonight it really is never again. The team's memorable 40-year run at the stick concludes tomorrow. Julie Hayner is at the ballpark tonight with a live report. Julie? Leslie, this is it, the last nighttime game for baseball here at Candlestick Park. And that means the last night for Giants fans to celebrate in the parking lot. Thousands held lively tailgate parties this evening as they get ready to bid farewell to the old ballpark. That's why I have my glasses on to hide the tears. That's, real, that's the truth. I love this place. I love, always love night games. They're the best. I'll miss it a lot. She's biting into it before she <laughs> Many tailgaters in shorts and short sleeves served up quite a feast, hot dogs, tri-tip, and plenty of cold drinks. It's a gorgeous night, man. It's a perfect night for the last night at Candlestick. It's totally atypical. Over the past four decades, Candlestick has become notorious for its lousy weather. The players and the fans have endured years of wind and cold, but not tonight. Ironically, on this final night at Candlestick, the weather couldn't be better. There's no fog, it's not cold. God must have a sense of humor. <laughs> Earl Smith has been coming to Giants games since he was a little boy. Now it's something he does with his children. As he and his son Franklin get ready to meet the rest of the family, Smith says tonight is a night he'll always remember. My dad brought me here when I was really young, and I brought my daughter here from the time she was three years old on, so it's, not, it's, it's a weird feeling. I love the new park, but I'll always love this place. Candlestick is now the fifth oldest park in the majors and home to some of the best in the game. Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, and Juan Marichal. It's a field of memories, and Giants memories are something this man has a lifetime of. The best memory of Candlestick Park was the uh, no-hitters back-to-back with Gaylord Perry pitching one game and uh, Ray Washburn and the Cardinals pitching the next game. We, that's who we played that, that series. That's a feat that's never been done before in baseball. As the Giants equipment manager, Mike Murphy has never missed a game in 40 years. And now with the team headed to its new $319 million stadium in downtown San Francisco next season, Murphy says it's time to go. You feel good, you know what I mean, that uh, it's coming to an end it's like an old uh, car running out of gas and new motor. We're going into a new Cadillac of a ballpark and everybody's too happy. The whole city would be happy for the new ballpark. 196 days and counting until Pac Bell Park opens to the public. Right now, though, all eyes are on the Giants as they take on their longtime rivals, the Dodgers. And the Giants' final home game gets underway tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock right here at the Stick. And, of course, Mark Abanez will have all of the highlights of tonight's game coming up a bit later in sports. Julie, thank you. KTVU will kick off final day festivities at Candlestick Park tomorrow with a special live broadcast from the ballpark. Mornings on 2 will be there with a full lineup of special guests to give the old ballpark a fitting farewell. That's Mornings on 2 live from the stick tomorrow between 7 and 9. The latest saga in the travails of former Golden State Warrior guard Latrell Sprewell is playing before a jury in Contra Costa County this week. Sprewell is accused of causing an injury accident with erratic driving while speeding on an East Bay freeway. Today, the former Golden State Warrior basketball player took the witness stand to defend himself in that civil suit. John Sasaki is in Martinez for the live report. John? Dennis, inside the Contra Costa Superior Courthouse today, Latrell Sprewell spent about an hour on the witness stand. The two people hurt in the accident want the basketball star to pay as much as $3 million in damages. After testifying, Sprewell had little more to say. I'm not talking. No comment. 
Cameras were not allowed inside the courtroom, but while testifying, Sprewell admitted that on March 1st, 1998, he was driving his Mercedes faster than the speed limit as he headed south on Interstate 680 through Pleasant Hill. The Highway Patrol says Sprewell was in the lane for the now non-existent Oak Park Boulevard exit when he swerved back onto the highway, hitting these sand barrels, a wall, and a Toyota carrying Irma Feliciano and Arnolfo Perlis. They are now suing Sprewell, saying he showed a conscious disregard for the safety of others. He admitted to the police officer that he was traveling uh, 90 miles an hour on the Benicia Bridge, and he admitted to the police officer that he was traveling 75 to 80 when he was in the exit lane. Other witnesses testified that Sprewell had been zigzagging around other cars for several miles before the accident. DMV records show that the former Golden State Warrior has had his license suspended several times, revoked once, and had his insurance canceled once. One of the allegations we've made in this case is that he showed a conscious disregard for the rights and safety of other people on the road. Um, Sprewell's attorney said little more than his client following today's testimony. My only comment is that uh, Mr. Sprewell does his playing on the basketball court, and I do my talking in the court. Thank you, gentlemen. Sprewell has admitted his part in causing the accident. His attorney is contesting the size of the claim, saying $3 million in damages is far too much. A doctor testified for the defense yesterday that he believed the two accident victims were not badly injured. The question for the jury now is how much to award the victims. Closing arguments are expected as early as early next week. Dennis, Leslie, back to you. John Sasaki, thank you. In a rare gathering in San Francisco, all but two of the candidates for mayor took part in a televised debate tonight. Current Mayor Willie Brown joined 11 lesser-known candidates. Amber Lee is in the city with a live report. Amber? Dennis, this is the third televised debate of the San Francisco mayoral campaign. Twelve of the 14 candidates participated. Incumbent Mayor Willie Brown did show up but was late. Absent were frontrunners Clint Riley and former Mayor Frank Jordan. Unlike the two previous debates where only the three frontrunners were invited to speak, every candidate had their say tonight. The field of candidates includes an 83-year-old retired teacher and a self-described lesbian Latina. A public servant is one that treats people as equal with dedication and fairness. Lucretia Bermudez, the only female candidate, was hauled away by police from both previous debates for causing a ruckus. Tonight, she answered questions politely. She and all the candidates addressed issues in the one minute allowed per question. Several candidates took the expected pot shots at Mayor Willie Brown. The mayor gets $146,000 to be a public servant and to serve the needs of all San Franciscans, not just those that contribute to their campaigns. We have a government of Chevron, by the Gap, and for PG&E. But what we need is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Candidates also answered questions about how they would solve the homeless problem. 20% of the people, they need housing, very nice people. So in order to accommodate, we have allowed for the candlestick park is closed, so we can use them right there in the parking lot. We can make tents. I would require that all general assistance payments be made electronically through vouchers so people couldn't use them for drugs. Candidates were asked what criteria they would use to make political appointments. Everyone that's ever been mayor in San Francisco knows they're on the hot seat. Uh, do we want to be San Francisco? Do we want to be a big city? We've seen other big cities go back to the strong mayor government. Oakland right across the bay did it just not long ago. Or do we want to become more and more fractious and become an oversized Berkeley? I don't. In closing, Mayor Brown took credit for a wide variety of accomplishments as reasons why he should be reelected. This city was not terribly safe when I became mayor. You wanted someone who could get the job done not only on the question of crime, but on many other areas of, of interest. Crime is down by 40%. The city finances were in shambles. Today we have a surplus of more than $100 million, and we've had consistent surpluses since I've been mayor of the city. The turnout for tonight's debate was much smaller than expected. About 300 people attended, and there were plenty of seats available. Dennis Leslie. Amber Lee, thank you. As unusual as tonight's debate was, things were perhaps even more unusual earlier today. That's when candidate Clint Riley held a press conference about his own, quote, mistakes. As we mentioned, Riley skipped tonight's debate, and as political editor Randy Shandabill reports, he almost skipped the press conference as well. The Clint Riley for Mayor campaign took on some sensitive issues today, calling a press conference to make a, quote, major announcement. 
Reporters were told it would be about rumors and allegations of drinking and abusive behavior toward women. Amy, what are you doing? Please stop. You know, you're not allowed in here. Please stop. But when reporters tried to talk to Riley at his own press conference, they were told he wouldn't be appearing. 35 women would speak for him. I have known Clint almost 20 years now. Why won't Clint Riley come in and answer the question? Because I think it's time for an objective group to come in and answer these questions instead of listening to the smear campaigns from the brown. The are these smear women objective? You've brought I them think here. they are. The women, all wearing Clint Riley buttons, said that recent Willie Brown ads were unfair and inaccurate. On TV and in newspapers, Brown ads have linked Riley with sex harassment and assault and accused him of smearing Senator Dianne Feinstein. Clint is one of the most progressive uh, male that I have met. The Riley campaign also unveiled an extremely unusual ad today. I'm Clint Riley. 20 years ago, I had a drinking problem. I made mistakes I deeply regret. The admission is designed to get Willie Brown off Clint Riley's back, take the issue away. At the press conference, after several reporters loudly complained about his absence, Riley finally showed up. He's spending his entire war chest attacking me on television and the mail. Clint Riley complains about negative campaigning, but he's certainly done his share, both as a campaign consultant for other candidates in the past, and he's doing it this year as a candidate himself. He's repeatedly called Willie Brown the most corrupt San Francisco mayor in decades. And former mayor Frank Jordan told us Riley ran some negative ads on his behalf last campaign. Clint knows how to go for the juggler because he's done it in other campaigns. There's no question about it. Are you saying that you never fired Diane Feinstein, that you were never accused of battering an ex-girlfriend? I, uh, uh, at a certain point, was forced as a man to, and as a human being, to come face to face with my mistakes and my limitations and realize that I had a serious problem with alcohol. Riley says since he stopped drinking, he's stopped making other mistakes as well. He didn't say what those mistakes were. Randy Shandeville for the 10 o'clock news. There is much more straight ahead on tonight's 10 o'clock news. What are your chances of being hit by a car when you cross the street? New statistics say that the danger here in the Bay Area is greater than you may think. Those who lost, lost loved ones in San Francisco's deadly 101 California shooting win a big victory in court. And a bit later, this pristine parcel of land changed hands today, and that may help a dream come true for Bay Area hikers. You know, my next reaction is go back in the game just because, you know, I felt pretty good. And tonight, Steve Young talks about his latest concussion. 10 o'clock news continues in less than two minutes. A California appeals court today reinstated a lawsuit against the makers of two guns used in San Francisco's deadly 101 California shooting six years ago. Survivors and relatives of the victims are trying to sue Miami-based Navigar Incorporated for negligence. The company manufactured and marketed the DC, the Tech DC-9 semi-automatic weapons gunman Jean-Luigi Ferry used to kill eight people and wound six others. Today, the court allowed the lawsuit to proceed, saying Navigar marketed the guns in ways attractive to criminals. They should have known the guns might be used to kill people. Gun manufacturers, those specifically who make assault weapons that are designed specifically and only to kill people, are going to have to change the way they do business. They're going to have to uh, make sure that they don't uh, advertise these weapons specifically for criminals. They're going to have to make sure that they don't make these weapons easily adaptable to become automatic weapons. They're going to have to exercise much greater care than they have in the past. Today's ruling marks the first time any appellate court in the nation has allowed a lawsuit against a gunmaker in connection with a criminal shooting. Navigar may appeal today's decision to the California Supreme Court. The company no longer makes the Tech DC-9. Its original version was banned by federal law in 1994. Just going out for a walk may be a dangerous thing to do these days, and it's not only because of crime in the streets, it's because of cars in the streets. A new report came out today ranking California counties for pedestrian safety. Los Angeles County was the worst. Mark Curtis reports from some of the Bay Area danger spots. 
Even before sunrise in San Jose, people walking to work play something of a dangerous game of tag in traffic. Santa Clara County now has the second worst pedestrian accident rate in California. The early rising Silicon Valley economy and urban sprawl are among the reasons cited. It's getting overpopulated now. I mean, you see a lot of people going back and forth. You know, like in New York, you see everybody crossing back and forth yeah, from one street to the other. It's almost getting like that, almost. And the South Bay pedestrian peril gets worse as the day goes on. I think it is very dangerous. Um, I've been hit almost a couple of times, Come, had a couple of close calls. Uh, I always have to watch, and I'm surprised when a driver is courteous. In San Francisco, a group of protesters greeted the report by taking to the streets at the intersection of Leavenworth and O'Farrell. That is where seven-year-old Anton Patel was killed a few months ago as he tried to walk across the street. Overall, San Francisco has a mixed ranking. While the city ranked 15th in the rate of pedestrian accidents, it still has the highest number of pedestrian fatalities in California. Some say more money for safety efforts and traffic enforcement would help. What I see is the, the cars get impatient, you know, when people start to go through the crosswalk and they crowd and they crowd them. I think that's probably the biggest issue. Other Bay Area counties also fared poorly in the study done by the Surface Transportation Policy Project. San Mateo County had the third worst pedestrian accident rate in the state, Contra Costa was fifth, and Alameda tenth. Now, improving the safety conditions for pedestrians in California could be a costly proposition, but safety advocates believe there is plenty of money to go around. They point out that 20% of all traffic fatalities in California involve pedestrians, yet only 1% of prevention dollars are earmarked for those who walk. In San Francisco, I'm Mark Curtis for the 10 o'clock news. San Francisco schools, public, private, and parochial, joined forces today and they took a stand against violence and for peace. The culmination of the day's events was a rally in Civic Center this afternoon. It was called Increase the Peace. Throughout the day, students and teachers took time away from their regular classes to talk about violence in society and particularly in schools. They held discussions about how to resolve conflicts, de-escalate tensions, and get along with people who may be considered different. Organizers said that this was not a one-time event, that this is an ongoing campaign. A new study out tonight says young American males are becoming more violent, in part perhaps, because that's how they see male characters portrayed on television and in the movies. A study by an Oakland child advocacy organization says the media is blurring the lines between masculinity and violence. Rita Williams has our report. Who are teenage boys' favorite characters and role models on TV? Like, uh, Bart Simpson. No, them, they're pretty cool. Since you attended public school, I'm going to assume that you're already proficient with small arms, so we'll start you off with something a little more advanced. A study released today by Oakland-based Children Now shows indeed Bart and Dad Homer are boys' favorites, along with such others as wrestler Stone Cold Steve Austin. He doesn't recognize the effect that he's having on our children who are wearing his T-shirts with curse words on their backs. Hayward Middle School coach Kelvin McLean says he sometimes sees the violence on TV affecting how boys act in real life. I see a lot more aggression. Yes, I do. Four out of five, Simpson. Impressive. But you missed your last target. Did I? The Children Now study backs up what McLean says. One of the places that boys go for solace, one of the places boys go when they feel sad and bad and they can't talk and they have no adult to reach out to is the television. Pollock and the study say what boys find on TV are men who are in emotional straitjackets. Shows and sports programs showing that to be a real man, they have to be violent and angry, lie and ridicule others. The media is perpetuating a very narrow and rigid definition of masculinity. Boys in America are in a national crisis. Guys aren't allowed to cry, you know. They have to be very manly, take control and things. The study doesn't say the media are responsible for real-life violence committed by teenage boys. When they can't cry tears, they cry bullets. But the study does say the media reinforce an unrealistic perception of what a man should be 
at a time when many children don't have adult role models in their lives. At its annual conference with the media, Children Now's advocates will be meeting through tomorrow in Los Angeles with TV and motion picture executives to try to convince them to change their programming to show boys better role models. In Hayward, Rita Williams for the 10 o'clock news. Still ahead on the 10 o'clock news, nurses rally in the East Bay over an issue that could make a difference in the health care you receive. San Francisco police have a new weapon to prevent scenes like these from being repeated this New Year's Eve. And is this just the start of bigger things to come in South America? That story coming up. I'm meteorologist Bill Martin, the KTD Weather Center. Where's the fog? It was here last night. We're waiting on that cooling trend. What will it be like this weekend? Your forecast is still ahead. Hundreds of nurses staged a noisy protest today outside Kaiser Permanente's regional offices in Oakland. The nurses say that they are upset that Kaiser is opposing a bill now on Governor Davis's desk that would mandate a minimum number of nurses per patient in California hospitals. The California Nurses Association calls Kaiser's nurse to patient ratio, quote, appalling. But Kaiser says the number of nurses that it hires should be based on the number of nurses it needs. California has the lowest nurse to patient ratios anywhere in the country. And so uh, this bill would establish uh, ratios in all of the uh, units of the hospital for licensed nurses uh, so that the patients would have some kind of minimal level of protection. Mandated ratios uh, infers that kind of a one-size-fits-all staffing works for caring for patients. Ka uh, Kaiser Permanente supports staffing based on patient care needs rather than mandated uh, fixed ratios. Governor Davis has not said publicly whether he will sign or veto the bill. He has until October 10th to make that decision. When the year 2000 comes our way at the stroke of midnight next January 1st, it's not only misbehaving computers that could disrupt our lives, it's also misbehaving humans. Today, San Francisco police said that out-of-control New Year's revelers could be in for a painful surprise. Rob Roth has a report. San Francisco police flex a muscle today, showing off their newest defense against unruly crowds. Police call them specialty impact weapons. They fire beanbags at high speeds, and when they hit, they hurt. It's been described as uh, the equivalent of about a 90 mile an hour thrown softball. Police say they would only use the weapon in a pinch, but it will be available to them on New Year's Eve, a night police have been planning for all year. They say 1,800 uniformed officers, including sheriff's deputies, will be on patrol that night. We are not going to be tolerating any criminal conduct. If you intend to come to San Francisco to conduct yourselves in a, uh, a non-compliant manner, uh, an unpeaceful manner, uh, we will accommodate you with the Sheriff's Department. You will be taken into custody immediately. Police say last year was bad enough. About 15,000 people crowded into Union Square and then spilled into other streets. Some climbed onto buildings or overturned cars. Others set fires and broke windows. Police arrested dozens of people, and the New Year's Eve before that was a similar story. Now with this New Year's Eve celebrating the year 2000, police estimate up to a million and a half revelers will celebrate in the city. All of this planning for all the city is basically geared for the 5% of people who cannot come to any kind of a special event and not have a good time unless they're being disruptive. The city is hoping to preempt any trouble at Union Square this year by holding an interfaith religious service led by Reverend Cecil Williams of Glide Church. The city hopes that will keep the rowdies out, and that suits some people here just fine. It will definitely detract those individuals who in the past have been interested in causing a little bit of trouble to think twice about it. It's simply not worth the trouble this year. The city is also setting aside three other spots to celebrate, all with fireworks and laser shows. They will be at the Embarcadero, Civic Center Plaza, and the Marina Green. But the shows will be rather low-key. No live music, no ball drop, and plenty of police. For city officials, New Year's Eve is a bit of a dilemma. They want the planned events to be enticing enough to attract large crowds to designated areas. But on the other hand, they don't want those crowds to become so big, they turn into mobs. 
In San Francisco, Rob Roth for the 10 o'clock news. Still ahead tonight on the 10 o'clock news, East Bay passengers climb on board as the newest Bay Area ferry line sets sail. And you may soon be able to hike your way from the South Bay sprawl to the South Bay beaches. But first, stocks showed continued weakness today on Wall Street. Here are the closing numbers. In News of the World tonight in Jakarta, U.S. Defense Secretary William Cohen arrived today for talks tomorrow with Indonesian President B.J. Habibi. Cohen said today that Indonesia must control its military in East Timor or face political and economic isolation. Military and militia groups have been blamed for the deaths of hundreds of people and for widespread destruction in East Timor. In Chechnya, officials said Russian bombers are hitting civilians instead of the Islamic separatists that they are targeting. 100 people were reported killed today. Russian defense officials insist that they are striking only the separatists. A stream of refugees is flowing out of Chechnya. The United Nations said it needs Russian permission before it can begin bringing aid to those refugees. And in Ecuador, a volcano spewed out plumes of ash today, fresh signs that it could erupt in a matter of weeks or even days. Volcanologists said a wall of the dome is crumbling and that magma seems to be pushing upwards. About an inch of volcanic ash covered the Ecuadorian capital of Quito, which is located about seven miles from that volcano. Here in the Bay Area, the Red and White Fleet launched its first daily ferry service from Richmond to San Francisco early this morning. The new commuter line makes four morning and four evening trips across the Bay. The first boat went out at 6 a.m. Passengers can expect a leisurely 45-minute ride from the Richmond Ferry Terminal to San Francisco's ferry building. A one-way ticket is $5 for adults, $2.50 for children. Commuters say that the ferries offer an alternative to the congested East Shore freeways. Uh, anything that we can do to get more people off the road, whether it's on BART or ferries or buses or whatever, it's all to the advantage of the uh, Bay Area as a whole. The ferries have scheduled morning departures from 6 o'clock to 8.15. The first evening ferry leaves San Francisco at 4.20 and the last one at 5 minutes to 7. The dream of creating a 70-mile hiking trail from San Jose to the seashore is a big step closer to reality tonight. A nonprofit group says that it has purchased almost 500 acres of open space in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Robert Honda reports from our South Bay Bureau. The South Bay is one of the fastest growing urban areas in the nation and has lost much of its open space in the process. Today, the nonprofit group Peninsula Open Space Trust announced it bought this 493 acre site in the Santa Cruz Mountains known as Loma Prieta Ranch. The ranch is a key link connecting the Sierra Azul Preserve near Los Gatos, Almaden County Park in San Jose, and a state forest and a state park in Santa Cruz County. It will help create a public hiking and biking trail from the South Bay all the way to Sea Cliff State Beach in Aptos on the Santa Cruz coast. We paid a million dollars for 500 acres, nearly 500 acres, um, and uh, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? When a lot in Palo Alto seems to cost that much money. Uh, but it is raw land. The previous owner, Chop Keenan of the Keenan Land Company in Palo Alto, points out he got market value for the land, but acknowledged he could have built homes and a vineyard for a much bigger profit. For Keenan, the sale wasn't all dollars and cents. There are places to uh, build and places to play, and uh, this one had all of the fingerprints of places to play all over it. The acquisition is also being hailed as a victory for environmentalists because the land has a unique variety of plant and wildlife, including a spawning habitat for steelhead trout, which is officially a threatened species. Peninsula and Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District still need to obtain some state funds, and the ranch will eventually have to be publicly owned and operated by either the district or a state park. The idea of a 70-mile trail from the South Bay to the ocean has a lot of outdoor enthusiasts enthusiastic, not only for the trail, but to slow down development. You've got to stop it somewhere. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, for the development to come up into the hills and the mountains, I think would be a real shame. 
Open space officials say if the transfer to public ownership goes as planned, the South Bay to Ocean Trail could be ready in a couple of years. In the Santa Cruz Mountains, Robert Honda for the 10 o'clock news. Some news items in brief tonight. Vice President Al Gore announced today he is moving his presidential campaign headquarters from Washington, D.C. to his home state of Tennessee. Gore said he wants to get out of the Beltway and into the heartland of America. Another possible contender for the Democratic nomination, Warren Beatty, spoke tonight to a Democratic group in Beverly Hills. Beatty proudly called himself a bleeding heart, tax and spend liberal Democrat, but did not announce his candidacy. In Hawaii, federal investigators said that the pilot of the sightseeing plane that crashed onto a volcano was flying off the normal course. Investigators also said that so far there's no obvious evidence of a mechanical failure. Ten people died in that crash. And passengers who use Alameda Contra Costa transit buses will have to start paying more on Friday. Fare hikes range from 5 to 65 cents. Coming up a bit later on the 10 o'clock news, what these people did today could help save your life in the next major earthquake. First, he was a child prodigy who became a Hollywood star. Now Dudley Moore is fighting for his life. In sports, an old nemesis faces the Giants as they play their second to last game at Candlestick. Up next, though, meteorologist Bill Martin will be along with a look at how long this warm spell is expected to last. Forecast right after the break. Wildfires are still causing problems tonight here in Northern California and around the state. A fire in Yolo County that started at noon yesterday has now burned across some 6,000 acres. The fire is burning in a wilderness area near the town of Rumsey. Officials say no homes are threatened at this time. The Yolo County fire is just one of several small, medium, and large blazes burning around the state tonight. Firefighters say that even though temperatures were hot again today, a slight change in the weather did help the firefighting effort. They said the humidity came up and the winds died down. And now if the temperature would just go down. It was hotter today than it yesterday. Was. Yeah. It was. In, in Southern California right now, they've got fire issues as well. Santa Ana wind conditions, conditions developing down there, strong gusty winds, that could be a problem for them. Around the bay, we'll take you to Mount Diablo. It's been closed since Sunday because of high fire danger. It was hot up there today, but humidity's up just a touch and winds down. Mount Diablo opened up today. Another picture, the Oakland Hills. This taken this morning, pretty windy there. Now the winds were less this morning, but still, as you can see from the trees, blowing to 15 to 20 miles an hour out of the offshore uh, direction. As the winds come down, they really funnel through the canyons. That's why it's so windy in the hills. Uh, picture today, we're looking for the fog and you're just not going to see it. Air quality did not look that good today. Lots of smoke in the air from all the fires that are burning around and pollutants from all the cars. Watch the sunset and we do this enough that when you see that, look at the, re the refraction there, all the red. It's beautiful, but it tells you that the air quality, not great. Where's the fog? A picture in Martinez. It's not in Martinez. Right now, Martinez, temperature 70 degrees. It is warm. We'll go to the marina in San Francisco, looking towards the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a nice shot, and there is no fog. We are seeing fog just off the Golden Gate Bridge, about 50 miles offshore. It should be right at the coast tomorrow morning. Should cool things a little bit. A live picture at Candlestick Park right now in San Francisco, 69 degrees. Candlestick Park, it's 70, 75 on Vallejo. And at this hour, it is 74 degrees in San Jose. Temperatures in the Bay Area today, two to four degrees warmer than yesterday. I, I said it would cool down, and it did not. We saw fog in here. That's usually an indication. This was last night, but the fog this morning immediately got pushed offshore by a strong offshore flow. Temperatures tomorrow. This is what they'll look like. These are very warm temperatures. Still, air quality won't be that great, and you're going to see plenty of 90s. Coastal sections, a little cool down. We should see fog patchy along the coast, and that'll keep Pacifica down to 70 and Half Moon Bay 67 degrees. It, oh, all in all, it should be a really nice uh, day along the coast because the fog will come in, cool it off, and then it'll burn off. Here's how it looks. The satellite imagery just shows the big high pressure center. What you can't see here, this doesn't pick up the fog real well, the, the gray stuff along here, but we are seeing fog right now just off the San Francisco Bay. Tomorrow morning, it'll be kind of like it was this morning in many locations, real tight and dense along the coast, but then it'll pull away. So the cooling trend's underway, but it's going to be very slow. Here's what we expect the next 48 hours, and this is statewide. Overnight lows in the Lake Tahoe region in the low 30s, daytime high. 75 for Thursday, Central Valley in the 90s. Fire danger is still very high in the Bay Area. We've got higher humidities, less wind, but the temperatures are still very warm. We'll take you out of the national radar and you'll see some very strong storms and lots 
of rain coming down, thunder and lightning, but also where they don't need it in the Carolinas. They've had some really bad problems with flooding, and it continues. Look at the forecast for tomorrow. If you're traveling the East Coast tomorrow, you want to check your carriers, especially from New York down to Washington. Some of those storms could be severe enough to cause flight delays. Everywhere else, uh, as you head east or west, fall-like weather conditions, and the airports should be pretty easy traveling. Sunny, 65 to 90 degrees, a little cooler coastside. That 65 will be Half Moon Bay. The 90 degree reading will be certainly inland Concord. It, Livermore could even go higher, maybe 93. Coastal low clouds and fog will make their way in as we move towards the weekend. This slow or this cooling trend is moving along very slowly, but all the weather models and computer models suggest that it will be here by the weekend and we should have a lot Bring of it on. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, Bill. Okay. Coming up on the 10 o'clock news, actor Dudley Moore reveals that he has a deadly disease. And consumer editor Tom Vekar shows us how NASA is preparing to help you in the next major earthquake. British-born actor and comedian Dudley Moore had sad news to report today. He is suffering from an incurable and deadly illness. Health and Science Editor John Fowler reports on Moore's case and on this little-known disease. In the movie 10, he reached stardom opposite Bo Derrick. Dudley Moore, the impish British actor, a child prodigy pianist turned comic. Today, Moore acknowledged he's suffering from a rare and incurable brain disorder. It's called PSP, related to Parkinson's disease. It's a rapidly progressive condition, more so than Parkinson's disease. It can be quite disabling, uh, particularly when people are unable to walk or unable to walk safely. They can develop difficulty with swallowing, uh, difficulty with um, speaking, um, and communication is a problem. Moore's doctor today said the 64-year-old actor is in the early stages of PSP, but already has trouble walking, swallowing, and seeing. Moore himself said in a statement today he's hoping to raise public awareness, similar to what Michael J. Fox did yesterday on Capitol Hill, explaining his battle with Parkinson's disease. In fact, experts say many patients diagnosed with Parkinson's actually have PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. But unlike Parkinson's, PSP does not respond to treatment. Moore says doctors diagnosed his illness a few months ago, but that he's had symptoms for the past five years. Experts say most patients die 10 years after symptoms begin. That PSP usually hits people in their 60s when something triggers lesions in the brain. There are a number of different areas in the brain where the nerve cells degenerate. We don't know why this happens. Doctors say research is desperately needed on both Parkinson's and PSP. That as the American population ages, more of us will develop these neurological disorders. And medical science is a long ways from effective therapy or a cure. I'm John Fowler for the 10 o'clock news. One of the world's most acclaimed search and rescue teams held a drill today at the NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field. Consumer editor Tom Vakar reports on that drill and on what those rescuers will be doing if and when a major earthquake strikes the Bay Area. NASA's Disaster Assistance and Rescue Team, nicknamed DART, is one of only five urban search and rescue teams in California. Its job, an exceedingly delicate and dangerous one. Pound, hammer, drill and bore through collapsed buildings to save victims trapped inside without collapsing the rest of the building. And we go in and we affect the rescue of people that we consider entombed, that have been trapped to where you have to do what we call selective debris removal. DART's primary function is to assist the thousands of people at Moffett Field in the event of a natural disaster or terrorist attack. But they're on call to help others near and far. We work with various cities, uh, and we train with them, we work with them. They know that if they have to call us, if they have a localized event or something where we're not tied up out here, all they have to do is call our dispatch center and they can have us within a couple of hours. DART assisted in Hawaii's Hurricane Iniki, the Oakland Firestorm, the Oklahoma City bombing, and Loma Prieta. That's what got aerospace engineer Phil Snyder involved 10 years ago. When I found out about that after twiddling my thumbs at home for a few days, um, I said that was something I wanted to do. As a wind tunnel mechanic, Tom Timble is used to high places and closed in spaces. Not everybody could do that, the height wise and the claustrophobia wise. And I felt that, you know, I could help people with things that, you know, not everybody could do. Former NASA employee and now full-time mom, Hope Wilden, says DART is powerful public service that supplies an adrenaline rush. Because I love it. 
when I joined DART, they told me it would be addictive. And I did it more as to get some training, and it's addictive. In a truly catastrophic quake or other disaster, the major search and rescue teams will be going to the sites of mass casualties, things such as collapsed hotels or hospitals. They will not be coming to your neighborhood, which is why it's so important to get training in light search and rescue, something readily available in your own community. Tomorrow night, how to get free neighborhood search and rescue training and a free seismic analysis of your house to keep it from collapsing. I'm consumer editor Tom Vacar for the 10 o'clock news. Well, the moments are winding down for Candlestick Park. Sports Director Mark Abani is here to tell us all about that in the Giants games. The last this and the last that right now. <laughs> the last night game. Best part about it, maybe we don't have to hear the complaints about the evening breeze out there. That cool evening breeze. And we'll show you the strangest thing that did happen on the field tonight. Also, Joe Fonzie along with a full report about the new kid in town. You know, the one who will be taking Steve Young's place come Sunday afternoon. All the sports in just a few seconds. Now you figure you're bound to see something weird when the Giants go heads with the Dodgers in the last series ever at the stick. And considering how things have gone over the past few years, what's wackier than San Francisco actually beating Kevin Brown? Downright unheard of. And Tommy Lasorda loving to play the role of ham bone and the fans out there giving him one last loud boo. This is the first time they've ever beaten Brown. He'd been 7-0 against them with a minuscule ERA, but Barry Bonds gets it going with a two-run shot in the first, his 34th, and adding to it in the third. This is a clutch two-out hit by J.T. Snow, rifling it to right. Two runs going to score, and that includes Barry to undergo knee surgery Friday, but he's still sliding on the bum wheel. And then in the eighth, the relief crew in, 4-1 lead, and Jeff Kent taking it yard to right center. That's his 23rd. And that's the padding that Levon Hernandez would like in beating the Dodgers for the first time in his career. Brown is finally defeated. And so it's all down to the finale tomorrow afternoon at the stick. 5-1 final tonight. Games of meeting and not just for memory. Mets come out of their funk to deny Greg Maddox his 20th win and keep their postseason hopes alive. Mike Hampton winning his 21st and more importantly for them moving his Astros into a tie with Cincinnati for the Central Division lead and Mark McGuire coming on. He pounds his 62nd and 63rd homers to catch and pass Sammy in the home run race as the Cards snatch a pair from the Padres. Major downsizing on the A's hopes and ambitions for this season even before they took the field after tonight the math just wouldn't work for them at all as for their postseason ideas looking for a cup in a row against Anaheim but big Mova with his sweet swing deposits over and out against his former teammate Omar Oliveras just barely over the wall and the second the A's do tie it Ben Grieve can do that long ball thing every now and then himself that's his 27th also to right evens things up but the Angels put together a three run eight to break a 4-4 tie to beat T.J. Matthews 7-4 the final as it turns out it didn't really matter what the A's did anyway against the Angels their season had basically ended hours previously as the Red Sox taking care of their business There's bright and early first game of a doubleheader against the White Sox you see the final out Earlier in the game, Nomar Garcia Parra's two-run homer got him there. Boston still trying to shake off the curse of the Bambino, and this is the first time they've gone to the postseason in back-to-back -back years since, get this, 1915 and 1960, having a little fun at Fenway as they split the pair. Outside chance for the Red Sox to catch the Yankees for first in the East, but they're down four and a half, and they've got a wild-card spot no matter what. It was a no-brainer to keep Steve Young out of the lineup this coming Sunday after the shot he did take Monday night in Arizona. But now reality sets in. The team doesn't have their Mr. Everything. Joe Fonzi was at Niners camp this afternoon to see how that was settling with everyone down there. For at least this week, Steve Young's activity on the football field will be limited to this, staying loose but resting his battered head. Young's latest concussion again touched off a battery of speculation about his future, most notably why he continues to subject himself to such risk. I've talked about this a lot. I have a passion for football and, uh, and the, kind of the, the craft of football. And so uh, physically, uh, right now, just running around, throwing the football, being healthy, uh, I feel great. And so, um, but, you know, those years, those great years I call them when you're smart enough to play and healthy enough to play, they're there are some great years. Hopefully I can enjoy those. 
One thing Young doesn't enjoy doing is watching. Even though he was briefly knocked out Monday night, as soon as he had his wits about him... I felt that I knew exactly what was going on. And, and, uh, no, I, that's why, I, you know, my next reaction is go back in the game just because, you know, I felt pretty good. But Young's doctor has said he needs to sit out at least one week. And that means the biggest test so far for backup quarterback Jeff Garcia. I want to go out there and I want to have a good time and just let my emotions and, and excitement just kind of take over. And I think if that can be the case, if I can just keep some of the pressure off of myself, then things are going to be fine. There is history to support Garcia's optimism. 49er backups from Jeff Brom, who subbed for an injured young in 1996, to Elvis Gerback, to Ty Detmer last year, and even Jim Druckenmiller have produced wins when they've been asked to fill in for Young. When Steve's down, Jeff is up, and we all have to play better, and we've been here before. Every year, you know, whether it's a, a lineman or a quarterback or a running back or a receiver, someone has to step up and make this work, and now it's his turn. And I'm not trying to step into Steve Young's shoes. I think that would be the worst possible scenario for me. I think the main thing is to go out there and play within myself, play within the system, allow the system to work for me, and allow myself to get the, get the ball to to one of the best receiving cores in the, in, the, in the league. Again, a little history revisited. Young's series of concussions began in 1996 against Houston. Brom came in and led the 49ers to a win. It's that same team, now called the Tennessee Titans, Garcia will be facing Sunday at Candlestick. I'm Joe Fonzi for the 10 o'clock news. And we will have that game right here for you on Fox 2 at 1 o'clock, but that's the sporting line for our Wednesday night. Leslie, Dennis? Okay, thank All you, right, Mark. Thanks, Mark. That is our report for tonight. I'm Dennis Richmond. And I'm Leslie Griffith. For Bill Martin and everyone here at KTVU, we thank you for joining us. Tomorrow is the big day at Candlestick, and KTVU will be there live. You can join Giants coach Dusty Baker, scheduled to be there. It'll be quite a show. Should be. And we'll be back tomorrow night at 10. Good, Good night. night.